Hello and welcome to Health Matters on Channels Television. Thanks for staying with us. I am Mary Alale Yusuf. Emergency medicine is a specialty all on its own. It concerns the care of illnesses or injuries that need immediate medical attention. Emergency physicians specialize in providing care for unscheduled and undifferentiated patients of all ages. They are primarily responsible for initiating resuscitation and stabilization and performing the initial investigations and interventions necessary to diagnose and treat illnesses or injuries in the acute phase, which is a phase of severe and sudden onset, that it, ha it happens suddenly. Many are aware of the recent unfortunate boat capsize, which resulted in the tragic death of an actor and about four others. Could the story have ended differently? My guest is Director, Emergency Medicine and Ambulance Services, Reddington Hospital Group. She's currently the Interim National President of the Society of Emergency Medicine Practitioners of Nigeria, SEMPON, Dr. Faith Epekurede. Dr. Epekurede is also a Harvard certified healthcare simulation educator. You're welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Let's first have some examples of common medical emergencies in Nigeria. Okay. Um, in Nigeria, I think um, the, one of the commonest, I think the top five emergencies is road traffic accidents. Oh, yes. And um, various kinds of accidents. And then, of course, you have um, things like, um, and then when it comes to road traffic accidents, you find out that when a road traffic accident happens, oftentimes, what kills them is what we miss out on doing. We miss that golden hour of opportunity because of the lack of emergency care to intervene in that golden hour when it matters the most, such that secondary injuries now come upon the situation and okay. uh, becomes too late to intervene. But you gave me just road traffic accidents. Yes. There are other things uh, at the moment, and uh, it's amazing because um, in current times, you have things like heart attacks. Oh, yes. Uh, we're beginning to see quite a lot of them. Myocardial infarctions is the uh, clinical name for it. Um, and that's because lifestyle changes. Uh, what we eat is different from what we used to eat. And then, of course, the pressures of the times we live in is a huge factor. So let's know. backtrack to the case I mentioned in my intro. Yeah. What emergency skills should or could they have had mm. to intervene in the situation? Assuming maybe they called emergency and, you know, time is running out. Yeah. Could somebody have done something? Mm. Now, I, I'd like to take it in a different way. Uh, it's unfortunate, really unfortunate, what happened in that scenario. Um, I'd like to take it from this very first point. Awareness, mm. public awareness about emergencies is so low in our society. That is, you find that a lot of people don't know what to do when an emergency happens. Yes, they have no clue. They are just at a loss. And then that's the first step, that's the first uh, factor in what happened in that scenario. The absolute lack of knowledge on what to do. And then of course, the, there's the uh, public-private partnership aspect of it, where we're looking at educating the populace on what to do. It's one thing to identify what the problem is. It's another thing to tackle the problem. And that will not be something we leave to the government alone. But in this case, everybody was aware that it was a drowning. Yes. So what should they have done? Good. I still, to see what should they have done means that they know what to do. Okay, so what should they do in Very such a good. case? In such a case, in a place where things are working, the first thing you want to do is assess the patient 
and see if he's responsive. And if he's not responsive, call for help. What does responsive mean? Thank you very much. So the, you tap and shout. Hello, if you know the name of the person, if you don't know the name of the person, just hit him on the shoulders, lying face up and shout. Hello, can you hear me? And he says he can't, that is, he doesn't say anything. Well, how about a flutter of the eyelashes or something like that? Um, is that response? If his eyes flutter, then of course you go on and check other things. But the first thing to check is for responsiveness. And if he's not responding, call for help. And in places where things work, you'd call an emergency number. But I must commend uh, uh, Federal Ministry of Health because recently I think we've come up with an emergency number. The 112. 112. And they do work. I've called the 112 Fantastic. and the 767, so I, I can I can tell that. That is step forward. So call that number and you expect emergency uh, responders to arrive. But before they arrive, the people on ground have to be able to do something. That's right. You know, and that is where training comes in because most people don't know what to do. But if they know what to do, they start, if the person doesn't respond, you check for a pulse. And if there is no pulse here, then you start what we call CPR. But how many of the people in the, in the populace know how to do a CPR? And that brings me to this. One of the things we're doing at the moment in Reddington Hospital, sorry, I have to bring that in because that's my primary domain, is we're trying to sensitize the public, um, organizations, banks, uh, industries, uh, just the average man on the street about what to do in an emergency. So we have two types of training, the one for the healthcare provider and the one for the non-healthcare provider. So non-healthcare, yes. should we know how to administer CPR? So in non-healthcare, definitely we should. We call it heart saver CPR. That is for those who are not healthcare providers. They're not nurses, not doctors. Okay, so let me initiate it, it, it. It comes with the pressing of the chest yes. and blowing into the mouth. Yes. Well, how many times and in what order? Fantastic. Now, I'm not going to start telling you because it's one thing to say blow into the mouth and press on the chest is a totally different thing to do it. So what I would rather say to everyone listening to me is you can take, you can, they can reach me if, or they can reach the organizations that do these trainings. Some estates actually organizing these trainings for their estate members, that's the people who live there. So in the event of an emergency, you know what to do. You know how to open the mouth and give breaths. You know how to pound, press on the chest to give compressions. What that does is that you buy time okay. before the patient or, sorry, the doctor or the nurse or the paramedics arrive. And that's what happens in the developed world. But then that brings me to another problem. Even when some few people know what to do, they're scared to do they it. They are scared to do it because they feel... If it doesn't work and I'm found with a dead body Absolutely. on me or around me, Absolutely. I'm going to have trouble with the police Absolutely. or trouble with the mob. Absolutely. You're right. So what I must commend some uh, organizations that are beginning to do something about that. One of them is the Healthcare Federation of Nigeria. Uh, the president is Dr. Pamela Ajayi. And uh, I think some time back she had submitted a bill to the House of Assembly. Uh, it's called the First Responders Bill. And I think it passed the first reading. But unfortunately, it didn't go further than that. My question so, would be, why would a First Responders Bill not pass any reading? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they want to take another look at it. But I, I can't answer that question. Because it involves but, saving lives. Absolutely. You'd think it should just fly, isn't it? But I don't know, maybe they're still considering it, but I must commend uh, Dr. Ajayi for she's not giving up and her team are not giving up on that. In this first responders bill, mm. does it take care of how people behave 
around an emergency. Because in Nigeria, what mm -hmm. we notice is that when there's a problem, mm -hmm. maybe there's been an accident or something, yeah. people gather. There are people there, but nobody does anything. They shout, they scream, mm. they bring out their phones and start to take videos. What should people be doing? How should they behave in that space? Okay, thank you. I'll take that directly. When an emergency occurs, my advice to those who chance upon it is to take action. If you don't know what to do, call 112. Okay, and um, in um, the hospitals around, uh, you can also call, uh, we have what we call the Reddington in case of emergency, and uh, we'll put out the number as well. Yeah, the numbers and are showing. Fantastic. So in the event of emergency, call, you can call a particular number and an ambulance will show up. Within 30 minutes, we can, depending on your location, it might not be a very ambulance. We can locate other ambulances that are keyed into that our network. That is so to heartwarming. Up. Yeah. Because it shows that there's beginning to be some sort of network. Absolutely. Because why should an ambulance mm. come, for example, to Isheri North, all the way from Lekki, when you can get one at Ikeja? You're right. And it's not just us as Reddington doing that. There's so many other organizations partnering working together, you know, to do that at the moment. And I think that is so important. It gives us hope. And not just, you know, the fact that people are becoming more aware, and I must also add this, it's not just that the populace are becoming aware and private organizations are taking up the lead, but the government itself is actually leading. And I'll explain what I mean by that. For years, if you go all over the world, the Americas, the UK, emergency medicine was not always a specialty for training of doctors. I think in the Americas in the 1979 or so, they had a college for emergency medicine in the UK about 1990. Uh, it's taking quite a while. So it's really a recent field that is emerging. Absolutely. But it's taking, and how about here? That's a good question. That's where I'm going. It's taking quite a while, but I must commend... Uh, the Federal Ministry of Health and the colleges as well, because finally emergency medicine in Nigeria is becoming a standalone specialty. A bit slow, but we're getting there. I think about four schools at the moment are accredited for training of emergency medicine uh, residents. You have UNTH, you have uh, UCH Ibadan, oh, you have, uh, I think, uh, uh, University of Great Benin? Uniben. <laughs> That's my school. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> They're, they're, I should actually say they're, they're, they're more like pioneers. When it comes to paramedic training, for instance, Uniben has championed the course of paramedic training. And I think that's a very key uh, uh, um, skill. Field. We will go into paramedic training, yes. but that will be after the break. Thank you very much. Stay with us. We're, we're taking a short break. Meet us on the other side. Thank you so much. Welcome back. This is Health Matters on Channels Television, and we're talking emergency medicine with Dr. Ikwe Kuridi. You can call 0808-054-2233 if you have questions on the topic. You can also send a message at ctv underscore Mary A or send me email to moalale at channelstv.com. Talking about the paramedics, I don't see any in Nigeria. And people have this thing, you know, I have heard people say, oh, those are ordinary paramedics. I said, I beg your pardon. Paramedics can be the difference between life and death for a person. Absolutely. So shouldn't we, even in the medical field, begin to respect every other person's work? Thank you so much. But that's a lot of stuff in just one sentence. <laughs> but it's a very crucial thing you've just raised, especially the last part you concluded it with, respecting one another's skills and roles, because it takes all of us working together to make the whole and make, bring out the kind of outcomes that we want to see in the healthcare space. So to the paramedics, they're a very 
crucial and key player in the healthcare chain of survival, especially in emergency care. These are the people who actually are predominantly in the pre-hospital environment and they form a bridge between the community and the hospitals, be it primary, secondary or tertiary care. So it's unfortunate that we haven't given them the position that they deserve. But I must commend hospitals like the Redentine Hospital, not because I work there. They have paramedics? Absolutely. And not just having paramedics. They are, in co they are working in collaboration with the University of Benin to actually allow their interns after their first degree to come and do a one-year program in Redentine. And that is a huge step. They're allowing the paramedics do internship. Yes. So there is a course for paramedics. Absolutely. University of Benin has pioneered that and they're producing some amazing paramedics. But the problem we're having right now is that the moment these people come out, because we don't value them, the next thing they've jackpot. And they will be so valued abroad. So valued. So valued. So valued. So we need to begin to recognize that these people are very are key players in the healthcare space. Talking about, you know, the paramedics in the health chain. Yeah. Paramedics work with ambulances. Absolutely. They work with stretchers. They have their tools of the trade. Do we even have those, enough of those? in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Um, maybe in the night before the, uh, the millennium, not much because, uh, uh, but n I must commend the private sector. Um, I think the private sector is actually driving a lot of things right now in Nigeria. It reminds me of the, of the, um, is it a, a documentary I watched, The Men That Built America. It was more the private sector that began to do things after the Great Depression and build things. So I think in Nigeria, the private sector too is actually doing a lot. So you find out most of the ambulance services right now, especially, let me talk about Lagos, are more in the private sector. But I must commend the Lagos state government. That's another because thing. Because they have the I last wanted to say, you know, we're talking about Lagos a lot. Absolutely. We have other states. Th that brings me to a very important one I saw recently. It's a collaboration between the Emergency Response Africa and the Edo state government. That's what we're talking to, about. We should have more of this. Absolutely. They've released what they call the Edo EMS. And uh, it's made up of this small... Uh, buses that, and then they're training people in the community to uh, manage this and coordinate the services. So there are, it's coming up gradually. It's like little pockets of emerging care. And I'm looking forward to a time when they gradually coalesce. And that's one of the things we're beginning to work on with Sempon, the Society of Emergency Medicine Practitioners of Nigeria, that I'm the where I am currently the interim president, to begin to ad, raise this advocacy and awareness. And one of the the areas that Redentin Hospital has given us a mandate is to train. Redentin at the moment has been accredited by the American Heart Association as a training center for um, uh, basic life support, advanced cardiovascular life support. And I'm the training site coordinator. And uh, what that means is that we can, at every time T, all our staff, all our clinical staff are trained in basic life support and advanced cardiovascular life support. And our non-clinical staff are trained in healthcare saver CPR. L let us take this call from Ore Shegun in Lagos. Hello, Ore Shegun. What's your question? Hello. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Afternoon. Good afternoon to you. What's your question? My question goes like this, Ma. Um, please, can you help me pass in this information to the medical director there that they should speak to all our youth smoking in their hand? Hello? I can hear you. Okay. Smoking in their hand at the gate of... Mamim, 
My question goes like this. My question goes like this. I'm saying this to the medical director there. They should pass this information to the legal state government. In the front of arena market, I told you this. The rich people are smoking Indian M. Our youth with Nigerian soldier among them there. Smoking Indian M, drinking a lot of rubbish at the gates of Mami Market. Okay. I told you this. I was there yesterday. I got the drift of that. You see the number of people there, the number of youth. I've got the drift of that. Thank you. So, okay, you are welcome. although this doesn't have a lot to do with what we are discussing, but then it is... Um, it could actually lead to emergency. It could lead to an emergency, yes. yes absolutely. And uh, the fact that somebody is is uh, on using illegal drugs does mm -hmm. not mean the person has any less right to live. So one can call an emergency service for that. But we'll yes. deal about drug abuse when it's time for drug abuse. Thank you so much for the, to the caller. Um, yes, we were talking about ambulance services. L let me quickly ask you, what does it take to become a paramedic? Because I'm foreseeing that this is going to become a hot cake soon. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think from uh, I, I, talking with Professor Irubobi, you... University of Benin and uh, Dr. Abebe, who is the clinical lead for their services. The understanding I have is that they have to do about two years to get their OND. Okay. And then they go for the industrial attachment, which is what Red Intel is collaborating with them for. Okay. And then after that, they go for another two years for their HND. And then they are okay, ready. So in four years, you become a paramedic. Absolutely. I think it's I a worthy course, a very worthy course. Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. So, um, finally, because we really have a very short amount of time. Yeah. Have we done any airlifting, medical airlifting? Mm. That is something that has been operational in other clients for a very long time. I remember reading about somebody who, you know, had an accident. A pole went through his head. He was airlifted. Mm. His life was saved. His eye was saved. Mm. And that's just magnificent. Yeah. Do we have such services here? Um, Mary, yes, we do, but please pa just permit me to talk about something a bit different because I want to walk before I start flying. Okay, that's so permissible. <laughs> I'm looking at the road ambulances. I want to look at the, the culture mm -hmm. in our society, the way we treat these people when they come on the road. You, you don't so, let them pass. I mean, you, an emergency vehicle, an ambulance, is carrying a very critically ill patient. I've been in a couple in Lagos, and I mean, the bosses are fighting for right of way with you, even when the police or LASMA are clearing the road for you to go. These bosses are getting in front of you and calling you weary and all of that. I wonder if there's any way the government, LASMA, I commend them for what they're doing to be able to help these ambulance operators to be able to have that right of way. It's all in their awareness. Thank you very so, much. So let me speak directly to the camera now. The ambulance could be carrying somebody you know. It could be your That's father, it. your relative, Absolutely. your friend. And it simply means that life mm -hmm. is in danger. That's so it. give way. Give way to the ambulance the way you give way to the policeman. Absolutely. Give way to the ambulance the way you give way to uh, the president. Mm. It's that important. It could mean the difference between life and death. Thank you so much, Dr. Ekwekurede, for coming Very on much. the show. Thank I've you. had the, the best time with you today. Thank and you we so have to much. continue because I know there are other things. Yeah, so Emergencies much. in pregnancy, to mention so one of a few. Thank you so much for coming. We can fly after that. I thank, thank you so much for being there on the show with us at home, everywhere you are. Have a wonderful day. I'm Mary Alale Yusuf.